start off with one thing first, though. Sure. Sleep. Yes. Then we'll lead into it. Yeah, of course. Because I think it's important that um, I'm finding out what sleep with me is like really important. Yeah. But like normally for people, it isn't. <laughs> Some people get by with a little. little uh, well, uh, okay. Let's let's do this. Okay. Uh, ready? I'm ready. Okay. Welcome to Rick's Corner. Today I got Dr. Gnoli back. You guys have asked me for me to get him for over and over and over, and he's a busy man, but he makes time. Came all the way across town on a Friday through traffic in Los Angeles, which is like, you'd rather shoot myself. <laughs> it's bad on Fridays here. It's bad on Fridays. It's bad every day here. Um, I just want, we have a subject we're going to talk about, but I want to talk about sleep for a minute because you said earlier, yeah, doesn't everybody need sleep? They right. do, but you know, my girlfriend gets like four hours a night. She runs a big company. I work at four in the morning, seven at night, a lot of stress. Um, and then she'll take a nap maybe for 20 minutes to get rejuvenated. Naps sometimes make me more tired. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like... I, mean, I find if I take a nap, um, I'm really messed up as soon as I wake up from the nap. Yeah. But an hour later, I'm better off for having taken the nap. Okay. Now, what do you, you think is a good um, amount of sleep for the night? Well, you know, in my case, I, I found that I was low in thyroid. And when you're low in thyroid, you start producing adrenaline in like around four o'clock in the morning, which increases your heart rate, increases your temperature, increases your respiration, your alertness, right? You're going to fight or flight. Okay. So um, it, it, obviously if you're 20 years old, that's not gonna be the problem. But if you're 40 and above and you're not sleeping through the night, the chances are that you might be low in thyroid, and if you are, it's adrenaline that's kept keeping you up. And and what I'm discovering now, I'm reading this book called Recovering on T3, and they're saying that a lot of time, a lot of times the blood test will not accurately reflect. It'll say you're fine. Yeah. But you but your body is still showing symptoms right. of low thyroid. So my guy is having me rather than going by the blood test, he's having by go how you feel. Oh, you're still waking up. Take a little bit more thyroid. Boom! All of a sudden, now you're sleeping. Yeah, I'm gonna increase mine just a half uh, because I'm feeling that way. And I'm taking, I don't know if I'm taking quite a bit, but I took the thyroid and my blood test still showed low. Yeah. So maybe I should increase a little bit. There's a couple of things. It's a complicated subject. It's whether or not you have high T3 or high T4, right? And whether or not it's free T3, and right. whether have you reverse T3, right? And whether or not you have it swimming around in your blood and it's not getting into your tissues. Right. There's all these things. Selenium yeah. plays a role. So complicated. Iodine plays a role. Right. The thing is, is that, and and uh, for all of you that have injuries out there, this is just what I go through. Maybe you do the same thing. Uh, three nights ago, I couldn't sleep. I had a cold. I was up. Someone's texting me at three in the morning. Someone's texting me at five in the morning. That's what happens. You have a global audience. Well, I have my phone on because my daughter's out or overnight, uh, and I'm, if it's an emergency, she can reach me. Someone says, "Turn your phone off." I can't because what if she needs me? Right. You know. And then why are these people texting me so early in the morning? Don't they have anything better to do? Yeah. Come on. So I didn't get a lot of sleep, and I was tired all day, and my joints were just killing me. I could hardly walk. I was really sore. Last night I got a good night's sleep, and I'm not sore at all today. It plays a role. It Big role. Plays a role, yeah. Big role. Good night's sleep does wonders. Yeah. Okay, enough on that. Let's talk about what you want to talk okay. about. Okay. Well, we talked before about this perpendicular concept. Mm -hmm. But as I'm moving forward with this book, I'm assigning numbers. Okay, so I thought, wow, this is a really interesting analysis, comparison that I did here. So let's start off with, with, the, with the simplest premise that a parallel lever, a lever that is parallel to gravity or whatever resistance happens to be, is neutral. Right, uh -huh. it's balanced over the pivot. Right, right. Okay. Um, a, a lever that is 100% perpendicular with gravity yeah. is called a 100% lever. That means 100% of the weight of this hammer, plus its magnification because of its length, right, is having to be held up by my hand here. If this is 100 and this is zero, then 45 degree angle is 50 percent. Got you. I now, understand. that's not exactly true from a trigonometry standpoint. Like if you were a structural engineer, you'd have to do trigonometry to figure the exact load, but we don't need bodybuilders and fitness people to be mathematicians. It's a good ballpark figure. 50 percent, 100 percent, 0 percent. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So let's compare two tricep exercises using this information that we just learned. Okay. If you're doing a skull crusher on your back. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. Very, very common exercise. Right here, you can see I've drawn a dotted line where his forearm 
would become a 100% lever. Right. Okay? When he's that, at the top, obviously, it's parallel. That's, yeah, but that's where the, the forearm is parallel to the ground. Right. Okay. That means that at that moment, whatever muscle is operating, that lever is getting all the load. Okay. Since that lever is a 12-inch long lever, approximately, it's a 12-time magnification of the weight in your hand. Really? So if you have a 20-pound weight in your hand, that's loading your tricep with 240 pounds. But not actually 240 pounds. Actually 240 pounds. Really? Actually. But if you put 240 now, pounds... Now, I know it doesn't feel like it. Yeah, of course. Because that's the way our body has adapted. Again. Okay. Right? But if you were a structural engineer and you had to create a mechanism to hold that lever with 20 pounds in it, you'd have to come up with a force that holds 240 pounds. So if you had 240 pounds in your hands, it's twice that. It's 12 or, times it's that. 12 times that, I mean. Right? Okay. Okay. So now we're going to compare that to a parallel bar dip. Okay. Yeah, which I was telling some guy today that was doing, I said, this is a great exercise. Not for triceps, it's not. No, but for overall body. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. Yeah. Notice that the forearm, which is bent there at 90 degrees, yeah. also bent at 90 degrees here, right, is not perpendicular or to resistance, right? It's no. not horizontal. No, it's not. It is barely off of parallel. Parallel is zero. Mm -hmm. So that means, let's just give this guy the benefit of the doubt. Let's just say his form is tipped over 10% from between here. So if the middle is 50%, 10% is much less than 50%, mm -hmm. right? Okay. That means he's operating an 11% lever because the difference between 90 degrees and zero when it's 10 degrees is 11%. Okay. So we're going to take some numbers, right? Okay. If you weigh 180 pounds, and you multiply the length of your lever, which is 12, and you multiply that times 11%, you're loading your triceps with 118 pounds, not 240 pounds. But you're using 180 pounds of weight. You're using 40 pounds of weight with 220 pound dumbbells. Okay. So this is what, what I, where I say about efficiency. Why pay more for something and get less for it? That's what you're doing. You're paying a 180 pound price for a 180 to 18 pound benefit. When you could be using a 40 pound price and getting a 240 pound benefit. That's true. But what happens is this. You get in the parallel bar dip bar and it feels challenging. You don't know where, you don't know what. All you know is it's hard. It's hard. It's harder than skull crushing with 40 pounds. So, you believe that you're working your triceps harder than you were with this one, but you're actually not. You're just spreading it around. So your front deltoid is getting most of the work. Yes, it is. It, that, on, a, on a parallel bar yeah, day. Yeah, a little bit, yeah, it is. Right? Little now, you're getting some pecs in there, too, yeah. right? But even when you're at the very top of the movement, I didn't bring it, but even when you're at the very top of the movement, holding a 180-pound bar, especially if you're hanging weights on you, right, that's just a lot of stress on the wrists, on the forearms, on the elbows, all of that. And you said, so what's the payoff? 118 pounds. Why, why don't I just... Now, here's what I want to get at, is that you shouldn't care how much you're actually lifting. Your muscle is informing you of how strong it is. When you're using a, a perpendicular lever, that is the ultimate test of strength. If you're using 20 pounds on a skull crusher, let's say, and that is challenging for you, that identifies the strength level of your tricep. Why, why, why would you feel that you need to use more? It's telling you what it's Yeah, I, I understand that, but what happens when you're younger, uh, you always want to increase your weight. Every workout you'll keep, I see you guys keep a lot. Oh, I just went up 10 pounds, went up 10 pounds, went up 10 pounds. On That's fine. Because they want to do more and more and more. Like Steve Merjanian, remember Steve Merjanian? No. He would do all well, this down to goals years ago. He was a big guy. He could do tricep extensions flat on the bench at 315 pounds. Yeah. He was extremely strong. He had huge triceps. Well, let's just say you're going to do, um, let's just say you've got a, an easy curl bar and you're doing skull crushers on yeah. a flat bench yeah. with an easy curl bar. And you don't want to use strict form. Let's just say you yeah, don't yeah, want to yeah, use yeah, strict form yeah. because, you, because you think you must keep up with your training partner who's using a heavier weight. Right. So you put on, let's say, 50% more weight than you can comfortably handle with good form. Right. right? And now you're taking it behind, you're throwing it up. Yeah, throw, I see that, so much of that. Throw. So now this lap movement initiates the motion, and then you have momentum. Yeah, it's carrying it through with momentum, yeah. So if you could dissect all that, your triceps still pushing 240 pounds. 
Yeah. All you've done is added weight to the bar and then subtracted it with momentum. Yeah, I see that. You've added and subtracted and the net result is the same. Same thing. In the meantime, you've used more energy, exposed yourself to higher risk of injury, and you haven't gotten any additional benefit for it. It's funny because I remember years ago, I could curl the 65s, yeah. really, and Joe Weider came in cold and curled the 65s. I don't yeah. know how he did that. He said he was really strong. And I do it every workout. I do the 2025s now, and they're as heavy to me as the 65s were. I, I, I always say to myself, be honest with yourself. To that own self be true. Yeah. Right? Use good form and don't pretend to be stronger than you are. Right. Your muscle isn't forming you. How strong is that muscle? It's as strong as as when you're working at maximum effort and no more. Yeah. But you always think that the heavier weight's gonna give you more gains and it doesn't. But it does not. No, it doesn't. It does not. I've seen so many people come in the gym and I'll do like heavy squats and there are guys with skinny little legs and their legs never get any bigger. And they're they're squatting four hundred yeah, pounds. Right. 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 Um, and, then, and by the way, strength and size don't correlate. They don't correlate at all. I mean, a lot of you guys out there think that if you go strong or heavier or heavier, yeah. you get bigger and bigger, but it's not true. I've seen guys lift a lot of weight that are skinny. Yeah. And I've seen guys that are really muscular, not lift very heavy. Rich Piana comes in the gym. Now, he's bigger than anybody. He'll do curls of 20 pounds, 15 pounds. Yeah, right. He'll do like 25 But he's years. a believer in high reps anyway. Yeah, high reps, yeah. yeah. And, I, and, you know, I, I believe in high reps. I don't believe in high reps at the expense of high weight, low reps. I just think it, it has a significant benefit, yeah. and so does the heavy weight, low reps. I don't believe it in every workout. And you should do them both. I, I, yeah, exactly. I think you should rotate them. Yeah. And you, know, you do the reps a uh, week, and you do the heavier weight for the week. Yeah. And I think, by the way, if you do high reps all the time, that you could burn out. No, you, me you, mentally you, you yeah, burn out. You do need to take... A, and, and by the way, when I say that, I know a lot of you guys are following my 50, 40, 30 plan. So what I mean by that is you don't necessarily have to start with 50 every time. Yeah. You might just say today, start with 30, and then move down from there. I tried with 50. Um, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. I will say that you must warm up before you get to the heavier weights. Yeah. So I would not go right to your 10 rep sets. Yeah. It definitely fits. So right. lighter weight, higher reps, even if, and when I say, you know, you burn out, what I mean by that is if you're using 50 reps with a weight that really challenges you for 50, right? If you do 50 reps with a weight that's nothing, it's not going to burn you out. Yeah. So maybe changing the reps isn't what you need to do as much as changing the weight. But, but you do have to sort of find your own pace of how much you can afford to do before you start to burn out. And that has to do with frequency of work cuts and all that. How often can you do the 50 rep thing for, I mean, for example, how many weeks? Because I know I used to do like, uh, oh, we used to do up the line, down the line, dumbbell presses and, and laterals. Probably two weeks and at the end of two weeks we were burnt out. We had to take off for a while and do something I, I, I'm telling you, it has more to do with um, the weight you're using for 50 than it does with the 50. Okay. So if you, let's just say that I start my decline dumbbell presses with 25 pound dumbbells okay. for 50 reps. Okay. And for a while that feels fine. And after a while I'm feeling burnt out. So what I might do at that point is say, okay, fine, I'm just gonna start my 50 reps with 15 pounds. Now it doesn't burn me out. And may, I might take bigger jumps to get to my final sets. Right. But I'm not saying you have to quit the 50 reps. And I like the higher reps, as I said, at least 30 before I get to the heavier weight because otherwise I feel like my joints hurt. Yeah, and they do hurt. Yeah, so, um, so it's, that's the delicate balance is trying to find what is the right weight for you today with that number of reps. And it does change a little bit from workout to workout. It does change. I have a question. Do you have something else there? No. Um, you were talking about dips not always being that great, but I remember in days when I go down to the beach and I didn't hit the gym that day, could be a Sunday, and I just would go over and do chins and dips like five sets each, yeah. super set. Yeah. A hell of a pump. Well, those were when we were 20 in our 20s. <laughs> you true. know, I just had someone send me an email, and th their question was, why do the exercises that used to work so well for me back then don't work for me so well today? And it's so true. Right? And the answer is, when you're young, almost anything works. That's true. And so we make the mistake of assuming that everything that worked great when we were in our 20s was therefore a great exercise. It wasn't necessarily, I mean, you could have sex and get a, a whole body pump. Uh, yeah. doesn't, doesn't mean you're gonna build a Mr. America body by having sex. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Right? So, um, when we get older, then you realize that the body has very, very specific ways of operating based on millions of years of evolution. Okay, dips are not good for pecs because they don't allow your upper arm to go out. Right, okay. 
parallel to your pectoral fibers, right? Because those bars are fixed and they don't go out and in, out and in, and they keep make your elbows go back. Yes, that's and true. because your elbow goes back, you, your arm starts traveling the fibers of the front deltoid, mm -hmm. not the fibers of the pecs, mm -hmm. right? So. I do kind of what I call a simulated dipping exercise on cables, where I, I bend over and I use these cables like this and like this. This is what the parallel bar dips would do yeah. if they could. If they could, right. No. Out, wide, and then in, no. close. Yeah, but of course they hit your legs, it would never work. No, right? the cables work fine. Which and you can pick the weight that's right. Which You're not obligated to use body weight or no. the equivalent. It's RickDrayson.com. He is the equalizer, baby. See you next time.